Oseo. Oseo. Wave the great feather. Oh. Starting off with a little haiku. There is a fence with a hole in it, but it's mostly on their side. The 19th century has been known as the century of dishonor. In Native America, it's known as the destruction of the people. A student of modern history, writing in a perspective called the historical presence, which means referring to an event in the historical past using the present tense. The European invasion, this is a quote, the European invasion into Native America uh, is the most virulent genocide in the entire human story. That's why I'm introducing this article, which uh, very currently has come out of the San Diego Tribune. It can also be found in more completion if you have Facebook as a native, you no know, Indian country today has a lot more detail to this. Uh, Canada agrees to compensate Indigenous children, and I will say, you know, on, on part of the Canadian government. Is this the first one that have very recently, I don't know, a couple of years ago, um, officially now no more use of the word tribe. All now use First Nations. The United States has not followed that yet. And the other thing is Métis. That's a French word, you know, for people of mixed ancestry, Native ancestry. Uh, in Canada, Métis have been given the recognition of Native Americans. So far, the United States government won't, will not do that. So here we go. Canada agrees to compensate Indigenous children. The Canadian government announced Tuesday that it had reached what it called the largest settlement in Canadian Canada's history to pay $31.5 billion dollars to fix the nation's discriminatory child welfare system and to compensate the indigenous people harmed by it. The agreement, in principle, forms the basis for a final settlement of several lawsuits brought about by the First Nations against the Canadian government. First Nations from across Canada have had to work very hard for this day to provide redress for the monumental wrongs against First Nations children's wrongs fueled by an inherently biased system. The system was the product of discriminatory policies put into place and enforced over generations against indigenous communities. This is the largest settlement in Canadian history. But no amount of money can reverse the harms experienced by First Nations children. Canada has been grappling with its colonial legacy since 2015, when the country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission deemed that the historic removal of indigenous children from their families for over a century, when they were sent to forced assimilation schools, amounted to cultural genocide. Last year, the discoveries of hundreds of unmarked mass graves at the sites of two of these former schools added an emotional urgency to the reckoning, including calls to abandon Canada's Day celebrations. However, Native Americans are 
ram tough. And that introduces my main subject. And we'll start off in this way. A wind of my own and we all win a yo yo neo yo yo neo yo yo neo Well over the Christmas holidays as we refer to them I had a birthday and for that I and many of my compadres convened in Borrego Springs. Borrego Springs is well east of San Diego. It is in the Anza Borrego Desert. It's actually at the foot of the mountains that separates that over there. And so the main subject, you know, here has to do with the bighorn sheep. We regularly call them Borregos, a Spanish name for those animals. And so uh, they're very, very much to that. And what I'm starting off with is a petroglyph that I found many years ago. You can go up here. So you can see, see this. Uh, I've made this as a display, so it's very, very uh, much enlarged from what it is on the rock. And uh, Eastern California well, east of 395, it runs up through the Owens Valley, and one of the first towns south of that, in the south of that, uh, Olancha, I found this petroglyph, and uh, it's a, entirely a Celtic petroglyph, so we would call this Celtic American, if not Celtic Native American. And what it's featuring, a very ingenious carving in the rock of an animal, because of the inscription, is describing it as a goat. Uh, goats and sheep are certainly related, whether there were actually goats here then, I don't know. <laughs> but it's being treated in this manner that, it's, that, it's, it, that it is a goat. And what we have is a uh, rock, a natural rock bevel, you can see, you know, lower going to a higher. And the image, you know, is this animal, described as a goat, who is in you know, the posture of leaping over or leaping up, you know, to the slightly higher level, which has all been incorporated into this uh, petroglyph and how that it, it, that, that it is uh, in, it's, it's speaking in the language of Gaelic, of the uh, Scots Gaelic or Irish Gaelic <laughs> and also using a system in that culture called Ogham which is not phonetic it is using strokes uh, for it and so first of all we look at the figure there and we would say that it is uh, skeletal you know as a, a skeleton you often see this in, in these petroglyphs and over on the far side there, I have written in the letters there, and that's called Taishbin. And uh, Taishbin means, the skeleton, means revealing. And the, the, the mean, whole meaning for that in Gaelic is, you know, Taish do trokar, um, doing, reveal thy loving kindness to us, is what that is uh, saying for us. And the way that we're, we're able to know that is we start up here with the, the horns, and the horns are the letter D, and the face kind of makes an X, which is a semi-vowel, so that's Jia, and then the two legs down here form the L, so that's one Gaelic word, meaning Jia. <clears throat> and then the lines, of the, the, like the rib cage there, uh, are the strokes. The first four is the, the S, and uh, you can see that here. This is the S, and then the, the remainder forms the N, so that it makes, you know, S-N. And 
here, this winger majig here, is another semi vowel diphthong for oi. So that's the where it's it's spelling this word here, oi shin. So it's like oi shin, like that. And then the last letters combining this with the two legs now are the letter G. G. So it's oisig. Jiawishin oisig. And that's translated as Dear Little Nook, continuance for this year. So that's why I'm presenting this as, you know, a new year piece. Further, the shape of the animal here, uh, the old people made uh, a kind of spoon, a ladle, from the horns of the animal. And that's part of what it's saying here. And it actually can spell Lug. Lug is a main Celtic mythical character of the ancient time and it also spells liag. Liag means the ladle and the meaning is he's a ladleful and the whole thing is titled Gabro Liam meaning goat leap and that is specifically used in the old culture as meaning uh, a sperm so he's very, very fertile there. So that's you know, my main beginning here. Uh, the Celtic evidence, Celtic petroglyphs, writings like that, abound you know, throughout this country. And they are in Eastern California. I have presented many other ones that I have found. In other words, uh, this is not recorded anywhere else except right here. And here I have another one. And what you're looking at here, again, this seems to, to use the idea of a goat. Now, now these people have stemmed from uh, the British Isles or the Mediterranean, where the goat is very much in those cultures, in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Yaquis are another people who have come from the Mediterranean who also uh, use the goat. We'll get that to, a, to that in a minute. But here we're looking at this petroglyph, again this is in Eastern California, and what's being portrayed here is a comb for weaving. It's called a cruet, a cruet. <laughs> and here is a hump there, so it's all called humpback, which is interesting to me also because the Navajo refer to the bighorn sheep and its uh, impersonator as humpback. And so here the humpback is figured in this illustration uh, and also has this circle and is another way of using the semi vowel as ui. And uh, so uh, this, you know, with the horn, which is called duan, and means uh, I sees. So this is all having to do with weaving. And here, this little figure here uh, is called a kroos yarna. It's a, Hank reel is for a winding measure of yarn. And then the, 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 these here again are the strokes, you know, in the, in the ogam that are spelling suil, suil, um, meaning um, for one, I, sui means I, the I for wool. And also it does spell the name for Sulis, who is the goddess of weaving. So you can see all of this all together and which would also seem to sort of figure to the previous leaping goat here. Gohar goat means is significant of motion. And here this is used impersonally with an active present and affirming meaning as Gohar Suas Liam, I proceed. So that's all in the Gaelic and the previous one is all in the Gaelic. So this is uh, Celtic. Um, it's been debatable whether the hair or fur of these animals was suitable for weaving. It's a debate in that case. And then we'll go over here to this one. Now this one is actually located in uh, what's called Little 
Petroglyph Canyon. All told, somebody's tried an inventory of these uh, petroglyphs, like there's thousands, there's thousands, but somebody made, you know, like 15,000, and almost 8,000 of them that were counted figure as the ram, the big horn sheep. This one that I found there, it's in an area where nowadays uh, you go with a docent from the Matarengo Museum. But used to be able to, you know, to go there, but it's very big, you know, it's, I don't know how, how big, you know, maybe three feet long like that. And it's in a very narrow kind of wash right here at, at uh, eye level and very deeply engraved. So it looks very old, much older than I see of the other very many engravings that, you know, are always identifiable by these horns. So they're in different postures, but this one is very specific because it is Egyptian. Uh, what we call with the Greek name hieroglyphs in Egypt is called netter, netter, and this is called the netter of Amon. Sometimes it's figured as Amon Ra, but it's actually Amon. And the, the way that is uh, saying, you know, that uh, this is Yua Neb. Ta-hui, meaning I, Lord of the two, and, the two lands. That's Egypt. Egypt is called the two lands. And very interesting to me that this is figured as a basket. Neb is a basket. And uh, the way that these, what do you call the legs, you know, going this way, the way that they're spelling these words. So it is a logogram for Amun, uh, the ancient deity of Egypt. And again, all of these petroglyphs, uh, all in that region, that feature, and I have others, these are the main ones I'm presenting today. Whatever can be understood or explained about uh, the connection of the Celtic people, the, I don't know how we could say pre-European or pre-Christianized uh, people that have continued the culture here into Turtle Island or Native America long ago and for a very long time is very evident. So that's the way we can, can say all of this. And the way I'm going to show some of these, these things that I have arranged here, for one, here, this is a mask. This is a Yaki mask. Now, many of these things, like this mask, uh, has been given to me by a resident Cherokee in Borrego Springs. He and his, his spouse, Mary, they have maintained, kept alive, a very active Native American spiritual center and ceremonial place. And he also at one time had a store there in Brigo Springs called the Ram's Head. So this very unusual yaki carving of a, a ram. Uh, it's, it's called a Pascola, a Pascola mask and it would have been made there in uh, Sonora, in Sonora, Mexico. And so that's very interesting because the yaki's relation is all to the goat. And here is a usual Yaki mask for the goat. Now, the goat, who is portrayed by a ceremonial dancer called the Pacola, or Old Man of the Fiesta, he's also a host in that way, but is figured as the goat. And the goat in Spanish is Chibo. And my compadre there said, we forgot our name for the goat, so we used the Spanish name, but I did research on it and I said, Actually, it's the other way around. Chivo is originally the Yaki name <laughs> for that. So there you can see that this is uh, a goat carving. And because the Yaki's themselves, their ancestors, have stemmed from the Mediterranean, where you have the Aegean Sea, that's the goat, and you have Ajipan, you know, the character, the goat man, Pan comes from Ajipan, meaning goat man, and so forth. There's all kind of evidence that 
of the goat uh, in that ancient Greek world there. And uh, this, this one also, these are all, all come from Borrego Springs by way of, of Ted Towson. Um, this one I'm using because of the lizard, and this, the carving of this, of the, the lizard. And so then with that I can speak of the people uh, who originally inhabited all this area that we're talking about, all the way from 29 Palms, east to Temecula, uh, uh, west to Temecula, east to the Colorado River, and way across the border also all encompass the native uh, pa uh, palm tree, which they also use for baskets uh, and other things. So that was all w within their territory, very, very large territory. The name Korea seems to be uh, made up by the Americans. It sounds like as if it was Spanish. Um, but the people themselves are actually called the Muruitam. That is that they are the progeny of Muyok, their ancestor, who will be figured like a lizard, so that's what use this picture on the mask, <laughs> and also as an upright stone pestle, because the pestle um, is active, so we'll call it the cultured people, the Muruwitan, the cultured people, the progeny of Muyok. <laughs> now, uh, I put all of these other images that I have made. This shield here was actually part of my exhibit that I did have uh, a couple years ago in Borrego Springs. So that's pretty authentic there. And I'm not sure if this one was there or not, but here's another one of uh, my Borrego. And down here I have a stone of Borrego. I'm not sure who made that, but it's a very fine carving of that Borrego. And you can see this this one that I'm illustrating with. And we can go down here and we look at this one. Now this one is from China. Uh, it's from the uh, Song Dynasty, we would call it. It's about a thousand years ago. It's a celadon and it's very fine and it was made as a water dropper for when you write with uh, ink or, or painting with that there. Now, in the culture, the culture of the people, the Kuya the, or the Murawitta, uh have totally incorporated the Borrego. The Borrego is Isiwitam, uh, is the name, is the Kuya name for that. And it is a, a totally together with the shaman. The shaman is Pool, Pool, the name for a shaman. In other words, it's kind of an American usage of the word shaman, and they've been applying it to everything, but obviously other, other uh, cultures have their own words for that. And the word for this is pul, it's from uh, puplim, puplim meaning uh, someone who is initiated. Initiated in the sense we're talking about, we would try to uh, refer to the teachings of Don Juan, a Yaqui way of knowledge, uh, that would be the shift a shift of perception, uh, you know, a shift into, uh, in the Don Juan lingo, a sorcerer, a sorcerer's way of seeing things and so forth. So it's indispensable in that way. So over here what I have collected here are all from Borrego Springs and, you know, the desert surrounding. And here, to start with this stone here, which has been Enhanced, I found there out in the desert uh, with this circle. It has, you know, been, like I said, somehow enhanced. It has a handle. You would hold it like you would hold a hand mirror. And it, it would be this kind of stone, a shaman's piece, Iva'a. Iva'a, meaning there is an ultraviolet uh, energy in it. We would call it a spiritual energy in it. And I put it here, uh, mounted it in this. This is a, a bowl made from the stem of the agave, the center. We have one growing in our front yard right now. <clears throat> so uh, that's what that, these are all native made things here. 
the, the basket also I got there. This is made by an Epi woman, a very elderly woman, with the rattlesnake. And in this case, the material is a woven juncus. So the basket's a little bit old, and the maker of it was very old at the time. And then I have some other things that I found down here. I found this uh, pipe with pipe, uh, pot jars at Arrowmaker's Ridge. It is a smoking pipe made of clay. And you see a little tab on there because a, a person tied it around their neck to carry it. They didn't carry it in their pocket, but tied it around their neck. And then this is a, a pumice mortar. It has a little zigzag on it. Um, people, especially shaman or uh, pharmacists and herbalists like that, so they would have ground something in it. And over here, in the shape of a turtle or a tortoise, is a kind of a grinding stone. These are all from, from over there. And this one, I will tell you in a, in a minute what this rock is. So, you can hear when you look at this character down here. Now we're going to talk a little bit of the myth. Uh, the, in, in the Kuiya, there are two creators. They're a pair, you know, and that is Timawayat and Mukat. Um, and I'm emphasizing here Mukat, what about him and who he is. In this context, because I'm featuring the Baregos, he is the creator of the Baregos, among other things. So he's very relevant for that. He is also the creator of the lizard, whom he created in order to swallow darkness, you know, and how far he got with that. <clears throat> and he also created the rattlesnake, and he kind of went haywire with that because the people, his people, didn't like that he gave the rattlesnake uh, enough power to bite people. They didn't like that. So they killed him, they assassinated him, and they threw his body into a fire to be consumed by the fire. Coyote, who was there, and Coyote's always showing up somewhere, <clears throat> looking over my shoulder, what are, you, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're, we're burning up Mukat's body. And Coyote could see Mukat's heart in the fire. So Coyote jumped into the fire and put his jaws, you know, picked up the living heart of Mukat and ran away, ran out into the desert. And wherever he went, the blood from the heart, you know, this spilled on the ground or on rocks. So this rock that I found out there in such a place, uh, this is the blood of Bukat on the rock there. So uh, Coyote, you know, is very much a part of this. Now, but even though that this happened to Mukat, Mukat lives on. He has another way of living, and that is in the shaman. The shaman is the emanation of Mukat. So we can see how all of these things all uh, fit together. Uh, people do have a dream of Mukat. That's how I have the idea, how he looks. <clears throat> in another a time, another story, I also do Tamahuyat, you know, because he went into the ground and he is the patron of coyotes and skunks and people like that. <clears throat> now you can focus on you know any of, of these here. I'm going to do a chant that somehow I've collected some time ago called the Big Horns Song. <clears throat> Oh, yes, I should say that while we were out there, we also uh, had rain, you know, where so it must have been a lot of weather, you know, this past month there. And uh, the bighorns did come down there to Borrego Springs into an area. Also, they have, uh, some people have made a golf course, so that's, you know, kind of a smorgasbord for these wild animals can come down and, and have, have lunch down there, and they do. So there's definitely a, a relationship between the rain, the clouds that form over the mountain, and 
then the big horns, you know, come down. So it was, and because the big horns come down, they bring the fertility there to the desert. That's, you know, that is a cultural part of this. Um, I've been a, a Yaqui Padrino since, I don't know, 40 or 50 years ago. And, and the, the Yaquis are a desert people also. So a lot of this is mutual. A lot of these uh, have immutability in these cultures of, of what we're calling the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. There is a reservation just north of uh, Borrego Springs. Um, there is a casino there. Uh, ostensibly, it would be also of the people who are indigenous uh, to this region. So here's here's our, our chant. As far as I can see, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. From the rain mountain, the rain mountain far away, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. Mid the lightnings, mid the zigzag flashing, mid the lightning flashing, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. Mid the swallows, mid the swallows blue, chirping, clad together, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. Through the pollen, through the pollen blessed, all in pollen hidden, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. Far as I can see, comes the rain, comes the rain with me. Hey, ha, ha, my guy, be alive, be dude, be dewy. Waho.